Thank you. Uh, so my talk here will be about Arctic warming, really Arctic amplification, and the atmospheric circulation. Another, uh, see, yeah. Another name could be what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. We've heard now about tipping points that occur in the Arctic, and the, the thing is that, that those will then have impact far outside the Arctic, and that's what I'll talk about, mainly how the atmospheric circulation transmits those influences. Uh, I'll begin by talking about the Arctic amplification. So what we see here is a red line that doesn't have a big slope on it, but these lines, have, I've, I've averaged them so that they sum to to zero over the period of 1980 to 2017. But the red line is the global temperature. You are used to seeing this line, and it has a much bigger slope then. The reason why it doesn't have such a big slope now is because I superimposed it with the warming north of 60. So the warming north of 60 in this data set is about four times the global average. So that's why the actual Global average doesn't look like it's warming a lot. It simply is warming a lot, but the other one is warming far faster. Now, all of this data comes from the European Central Medium Range Weather Forecast, so the so-called ERA interim analysis, which is a mixture of satellite data and observations and model results throughout this period. And this is the best data set you can get for temperature in the Arctic for this period. Now, if we want to know what the Arctic amplification looks like, what we can do is we can take the average temperature of the uh, Arctic before the millennium and after the millennium and simply take the difference. And then we see this map here. This yellow color simply says all of, all of the region has been warming. The reddish things tell you which regions have been warming most, and those are north of Novaya Semlya and, and, and north of Laptev Sea Basin. Uh, so this is the warming. That is, so this is really the Arctic amplification. Now, if I want to break this into seasons, which is quite important, I actually have to change the scale again. And that's this picture here. Then the, the middle is the same figure I just showed you, but with, with less colors. The reason it has less colors is because I had to reserve the colors for the winter time. In the winter time, the Arctic amplification is actually far greatest. It is bigger in the winter time than in any other season, although it does occur in other seasons too. So, and this is a curious thing. If you think of it, the Arctic doesn't receive a lot of sunlight during the winter time, so there must be something else going on. It's not solar heating. What is going on is partly that you're getting uh, thinner sea ice, but you're also getting more atmospheric heat exchange into the Arctic. And if you get atmospheric heat into the Arctic, you have to exchange that. That's why we call it an exchange. You have to take out some other air, and the air you take out is colder, so you can actually cool neighboring regions, or that's what you might suspect. And indeed, this is what happens. There is some cooling occurring in neighboring regions, especially where the Arctic air can, can influence snow cover, like in Siberia, and, and, and lock in some cooling. Now, how this exactly happens, and here we get into some technical stuff. Uh, Stefan was worried I might show you this. <laughs> How do you describe the atmospheric circulation? One way of describing it is actually to show you the pressure fields high in the atmosphere. So this is about five kilometers up, six kilometers up. So blue simply means low pressure, red means high pressure. And, and normally you tend to have lower pressures over the Arctic, higher pressures outside. This leads to a pressure difference, and I've tried to plot this up here with a nice plot that shows you the low values over the Arctic and the higher values outside. Pressure differences like this, they mean that there, you're going to have atmospheric motion that tries to flow from high pressure regions to low pressure regions. But as the globe is rotating, actually those pressure systems will end up encircling the low pressure system. So this is why we call it the Arctic vortex, the polar vortex. And this polar vortex will affect the path, the travel speed, and strength of mid-latitude weather systems. The thing is, what happens? As soon as we start warming the Arctic, we are going to sh make this vortex shallower. So in the middle, where it's deepest here, that's where we're actually adding in pressure. And on the edges, where it's highest, that's where we're taking out pressure. So we make it shallower. And so what happens? Well, I'm going to show you an example here, just from last week, of, of, of the jet stream that is flowing around the, the uh, polar vortex. And, and th this tends to vary from, from day to day, how it moves. But when you shallow the polar vortex, it becomes a little bit more unstable. And this picture here shows you examples from last January. This is the, the lines show you the, the structure of the vortex. And the colors show you the temperature. So red is warm, blue and purple is cold, and green and, and light blue is somewhere in the middle. 
And what you can see is you can see these intrusions of air, warm air that's trying to intrude into the Arctic, and then cold air outbreaks outside the Arctic. And the reason I show you last January is because during last January, most of the polar waters actually were episodes where they completely broke down. We had uh, cold air outbreaks that reached far south into the US, and we had warm air intrusions all the way to the pole. So in the end, you had parts of Texas with similar temperatures as the North Pole, which is not totally normal. Now, a recent article that I published, uh, wrote with some colleagues of mine, uh, and was published in the International Journal of Climatology, tried to sort of summarize the changes that are observed in the winter time. And, and I'll sort of just pick out two things that of, of our summary. One is that Arctic amplification weakens zonal winds around the polar vortex simply because we shallow it. And the second thing is that well-known teleconnections, well-known regions that we know are connected. So we have, for instance, known for a very long time that cold, cold winters in, in, in Greenland tend to mean warm winters in, in Western Europe and vice versa. These sort of relationships seem to strengthen with Arctic amplification. And also, another such connection, which is called the Scandinavian teleconnection uh, between Eastern Europe and, and the Barent Kara Sea, also tends to strengthen. Then there are others that do seem to go away. And, and, and so the statistics is sort of unstable on this one. Uh, another example of consequences is, is the summer consequences. Uh, and indeed, the wintertime consequences are, are in some ways harder to quantify and harder to put your finger on than the summertime one. Part of the reason that we understand the summertime ones better than the wintertime ones is the work of colleagues of Stefan at, at, at uh, his institute, uh, Petukov and others, who have come up with a theoretical framework for understanding them. And that framework is actually called quasi-stationary uh, resonance, or QRA. And, and and the good thing about having a theoretical framework is that you can test it. You can make testable predictions. And if they work out, you feel you understand the system better. But there is certainly evidence that certain weather patterns may become more persistent. You get longer heat waves, longer duration, intense precipitation events, etc. And these are far-reaching effects. Now, continued warming may make such episodes more prevalent. And this is published in a, in a recent article in Nature and, and has been then sort of added on to timing of that in, in another article last year. Uh, and just to explain this one here, this goes to the same thing, the, the, the jet stream as it adds a sort of, and, and the, the motion around the vortex. And the, the thing is, the motion around the vortex can, instead of, when, when you weaken it, it can actually become stationary. And then you can build up these, uh, these really cold episodes, these really sort of anomalous episodes, dry episodes or precipitative episodes in the wintertime. And these can lead to significant heat waves or significant... Uh, uh, precipitation events. Uh, this is from an article that Michael Mann wrote and was published in Scientific American explaining this concept quite well. And if you want an introduction to it, I, I would refer you to it. It's in the March, March uh, issue this year. So just to sum up here in the end, uh, both for the impacts and, and what I think are the policy impacts on this, anthropogenic global warming is amplified in the Arctic. And this is already uh, impacting weather systems far outside the Arctic. And this is an evolving field, and especially for the winter time, we do not understand all the processes completely, and I'm pretty sure that we haven't quantified all the impacts already, and some of them haven't yet materialized. Part of the problem is that we don't have good data, and even where we have good data, the statistics are changing. So, so you know, the future isn't really as it was supposed to be uh, in terms of statistics. But it's important to note that even though there is scientific uncertainty about exactly how things will play out, there's a different uncertainty when you come to policy. Policymakers can't really uh, sort of, can't really wait. It's not really the, the, the certainty with which we know what's going to happen, but rather the potential consequences of ignoring findings that may still be uncertain. And I think with that, I'll end. Thank you.